Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the ninth lecture on the series on fintech. My name is Dr. Sajendar Hanumanta Rao. I am the Dean of Faculty of Management at Manipal University, Jaipur. In the previous lectures, not only have we looked at the concept of fintech, what it is and various aspects and some of the technologies, we also have looked at some of the products in some of the domains of financial services that are being appended or that are being disrupted by this new concept called fintech. That includes uh, payment systems including credit cards, P2P versions of payment systems, P2P lending systems. Then we also looked at some of the foundational technology like blockchain. The various areas of fintech which are underlined by blockchain, the foundational technology is blockchain in addition to other technologies which are used in fintech as well as the concept of money itself, money, cryptocurrency, risk, these are all concepts which apply to cryptocurrency. Blockchain, however, is a technology which today drives a bulk of various activities in fintech. Blockchain, the concept and the technology is, are appli is applicable in various other fields too, including things like logistics, governance, education, things, uh, insurance. But fintech is the area, finance is the area which has adapted blockchain on an en masse basis. We have looked at the various things like cryptocurrencies. P2P lending platforms, insurance platforms, P2P payment platforms, all of which have, which have been built on the blockchain and sometimes digital cash also. We also saw a bit of cryptocurrency and the difference between cryptocurrency and digital cash. In this lecture, we will try to look at three topics, cryptocurrencies, money transfer networks and micropayments. Depending upon the time, we may push the third, third part of it, the micropayments into the Next lecture. All these are activities which have been significantly impacted by fintech, and fi these are that these are some of the functions, aspects, which are the fast, some of the fastest growing parts of fintech. So let's start with cryptocurrencies. We just got an introduction to that in the session on blockchain, because blockchain is the fundamental driving technology of most cryptocurrency platforms, and these are also the ones which are much in use especially Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogcoin, various kinds of coins and uh, so it is important to understand what these are and how are they different from regular currencies. So a cryptocurrency, what is currency, what is money? We saw that it is a medium of exchange, likewise here a cryptocurrency is a medium of exchange using cryptography to secure the transactions and to control the creation of new units. It is a medium of exchange like money using cryptography to secure the transactions. Not just that, the basic token, the basic token that which is the unit of money exists as a cryptographically en en encoded set of digits. The basic currency itself exists in the form of set of digits which are protected by cryptography. It does not exist in any physical form. Though some of you might have seen coins, gold coins and others embossed with the logo of Bitcoin. This is the logo of Bitcoin, you would have physical seen physical coins embossed with the logo, with this logo, but they do not have any currency in the outside world. They are not used as Bitcoin currency, Bitcoin, say Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency exists only as a set of encoded numbers. So what are the basic characteristics, basic features? One is it is created using cryptography. Various types of cryptography are engaged basing it on blockchain for record keeping and this currency is created like we know that every time a block is mined in the Bitcoin blockchain X number of 5 or 11 or 2 at any point it keeps changing, it keeps going down over a period of time and uh, that many coins get created using a cryptographic algorithm and gets released into the ecosystem. Whoever mines gets those Bitcoins as a reward and that they can use it for to do any business or any 
transaction. The currency exists as a cryptographic token, no physical form. So, all the coins you see are only for show, they actually do not carry any value as such. If they are made of gold, they will carry the value of gold, but nothing beyond that. The transaction use, using cryptocurrency is secured by encryption. All transactions between any two parties, which often times are public, they are based on a public uh, permissionless blockchain, but they are secured. No third party can change and modify that because they are secured using cryptography in various forms. All versions of cryptography, I devoted a full session on cryptography for this in this series. We saw that there are many types of cryptography, one way, two way, symmetric key, asymmetric key, things like that. All varieties of cryptography are deployed by cryptocurrencies for with different different purposes to keep the whole ecosystem safe and secure. And cryptocurrency disintermediates trusted middlemen with person to person transactions. In the case of money we saw and we the term used the money that we use is called fiat money. The piece of paper or a coin has the value that we assume, we accept because a sovereign entity guarantees that. In the case of India, the Reserve Bank of India guarantees that a strip of paper is worth 500 rupees, 1000 rupees or whatever. In the case of pound, the Bank of England says this is the value, a pound is equal to 1.8 dollars and various other currencies with a guarantee. In the case of United States, the 12 set of banks which form the Federal Reserve issue their own dollars, each Federal Reserve issues an identical dollar with the name of the Federal Reserve at the bottom and together the Federal Reserve system guarantees that this is going to be the value of the dollar. It need not be issued by a national uh, entity alone, the government may still guarantee that the currency itself might be released, may be, may be issued by a private entity like in the case of Hong Kong the Hong Kong and Shanghai bank, Hang Seng bank and a third bank together, all three banks put together, they issue their own currency notes, but they are guaranteed by the government of Hong Kong. So, that is the foundation of fiat currency, they have their value not because of the intrinsic worth like in a gold coin, because by fiat, by order they have this value and various governments take extreme measures to make sure that their currency holds value is widely accepted um, and things like that. However, in the case of cryptocurrency, <coughs> there is no central authority guaranteeing, guaranteeing that price. They do not even control the issue. We know we talked about money supply, how money gets printed and issued into circulation, how sometimes money supply is managed by the sovereign entities for various purposes to control inflation, to control deflation, things like that. In cryptocurrency, it all happens automatically. So, there is no trusted middleman, there is no equivalent of RBI and more importantly these authorities have no oversight over these cryptocurrencies also. They have no idea, they can actually participate like any other participant, but they have no authority. For example, in India, the Reserve Bank of India can invalidate notes, they can say from tomorrow 1000 rupee notes are out of circulation. They cannot intervene in the cryptocurrency market, they, if they participate, they will have same rights as me and you and everyone else. Cryptocurrencies by definition are global in nature, all cryptocurrencies issued, they are available to be bought across the world, they are available for transactions across the world and anyone can participate in the system and take part in the various activities like mining. And most cryptocurrencies allow pseudonymity, they are not fully anonymous, I can go as somebody else, Mr. X, so then the X I can become, nobody can identify trace it back to me, but all transactions done by me will carry that name. If I am Mr. X, whatever I buy, whatever I sell, if I do mining, they will all be accounted in the form of, in, in the name of Mr. X. So, somebody observing all the transactions, in the case of blockchain we saw that we can go into the ledger, the distributed ledger and go and see transactions from the beginning. So, somebody can see all the transactions that Mr. X has done. We can say that Mr. X bought this, Mr. X sold that, however, they not they cannot necessarily pin it back to me. This kind of a thing is called pseudonymity, partly anonymous, but you can see the chain. And most cryptocurrencies leverage the open distributed ledger, the blockchain to establish trust in the currency. There is no central authority to guarantee the value, there is no central authority to verify 
that a particular cryptocurrency, particular Bitcoin, particular, particular Ether I have is genuine, we, if the trust is established by using the blockchain as the foundational ledger. And however, the cryptocurrency must meet the basic features of money. For something to be currency, we know that they have to meet these three values. They have to serve these purposes, they should serve as medium of exchange, they can should be used as unit of account and they should be available as unit of value. All cryptocurrencies fulfill all three deals. By definition, though if you see the market and the buzz in the market, the way value of currency is going up, people are treating cryptocurrencies as if they are stocks and shares, they are assets to be bought and sold and, the value, uh, and gain the appreciation in value, but cryptocurrencies actually fulfill the basic three needs. They are not security, they are being used and traded as securities, but they are, they can be used as medium of exchange, as currency. For example, on Bitcoin enthusiasts fans say there are more than 1 million establishments which accept Bitcoin as in payment. Tesla being the most famous example, I can buy a Tesla car by paying in Bitcoins. So, they, they all treat Bitcoin as a currency, like any other currency, like dollar, like rupee, like pound. So, I can sell mangoes and get a piece of Bitcoin and I can keep a piece of Bitcoin and get a haircut for those establishments who accept that. So, cryptocurrencies do act like a medium of exchange. They also, they also act as a unit of account. In case of money, we said that a money a mango that I am selling is worth 20 rupees. Its equivalent could be, and this actually more than that, its equivalent could be 0 0.0003 bitcoins. You know, one bitcoin is roughly about 50,000 dollars right now. So, suitable, one part of it, let us say 1 dollar, 1 over 50,000. So, one matchbox, which is 10 rupees, which should be equivalent of so much, 0 0.0001 bitcoins. So, from based on this, we can make the, do the math and say that one mango equal to 3 bitcoins. So, these cryptocurrencies can also act as a unit of account. We can measure the values of items using this common medium called bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency and they can, they also act as a store of value. If I have 50 bitcoins today in my account, 10 years later, if I have 50 bitcoins in 2010, 20 years later, I will still have 50 bitcoins. Its value may fluctuate in a global market, but the currency itself will not decay. I still have that many, it acts as a store of value. The value may fluctuate, but the value remains in that particular currency. These are the three essential features of money. They also meet the requirements of transactions, as it. All transactions using cryptocurrencies are atomic. If I give you 0 0.0003 bitcoins and buy a piece of, buy a mango, that one single transaction does not affect anything else. It is one single full transaction. At the end of the transaction, I have given, you have 0 0.0003 bitcoins, I have one mango, one unit, nothing else is affected. Unless both parts are done, the transaction is not complete. We have seen in the case of blockchain that third parties verify both parts of the transaction. Once they agree that this is a valid part of the transaction, both parts of a transaction happen in one unit. It is not like first bitcoin gets exchanged to you and they do not give, give me the mango. Transaction is not complete. For the transaction to be complete, both parts have to happen. It has to be a whole unit, the buy and sell, give money, take value. Second is consistent. Every time we repeat the same transaction, same results occur. Every time I buy a mango from you, 0 0.0003 units of Bitcoin we directed from my account, 0 0.0003 units of Bitcoin will be deposited to your account. Isolation, only related transactions are affected. Only V2 are affected and no, no other part of the Bitcoin world will be affected based on each transaction. Each transaction is isolated, there are no interlinkages with anything else in the system. And fourth, durable, transactions are permanent after being committed. Say, we mentioned in the Bitcoin, once a transaction gets recorded, it is immutable, it cannot be changed, it is permanent. If you want to reverse the transaction, we have to do one more transaction, where you return the mango back to me, I mean, I return the mango back to you and you give me back my 0 0.0003 Bitcoins. But otherwise, once the, trans trans once the transaction is done, verified by various parties and goes into the blockchain, we cannot, somebody tries to change it one they will not be able to change it 
even if they succeed, it will be obvious that they have tried to change it. So, the Bitcoin reverts back to the original situation. So, all cryptocurrencies without, uh, without exception fulfill these needs of money. That is why they are called cryptocurrencies. They can act as substitutes for money with one important uh, differentiation that is they are not under the control of any sovereign entity. So, that is why many of them are not being accepted as valid currencies. So, some of the other features how, how these cryptocurrencies work. Like all money, there should be a provision to issue new money as the need arises because money supply should keep up with at the economic the rate of economic activities. If not, if the amount of goods in the market increases, if the amount of transactions, the economic activity increases, if money supply does not increase, we know what happens? Deflation happens. So, most cryptocurrencies have a provision for creating more money. However, and that process is called mining. We have seen what mining is. I bunch all the transactions, solve this puzzle. If it gets accepted, I add the next block. That is, I am mining and adding the next block and uh, this will result in more currency. However, in the case of Bitcoin, there is an upper limit on how many Bitcoins are going to be released. Once 21 million Bitcoins have been released, no new Bitcoins will happen. So, it is expected that Bitcoin will act in a deflationary manner. Some of the other coins also, some of them have no limit, some of them have indexed this. They max out after 50 million coins, they max out after 100 million coins. So, by design, some of the cryptocurrencies are deflationary in nature. We can, we can use this as like money for transactions. Whoever accepts these, these currencies, cryptocurrencies, we can give them, we can acquire them in some way, give to them and buy our goods and services. Most cryptocurrencies use a blockchain to maintain their accounts, to maintain the history to maintain the account of all transactions, they use a blockchain for that purpose and which is one of the key strengths. That is why they are publicly open, open to everyone and anyone can verify and bring trust because they keep the account of all the transactions happening that but in each blockchain keeps track of all the transactions using that particular cryptocurrency. So, at any point we can go and verify the origin and provenance of every, every unit of that cryptocurrency. And fourthly, we can do exchange, currency exchange. There are a lot of exchanges in the market today who will exchange these currencies to other currencies. For example, there are Bitcoin exchanges like Mt. Gox, which is not there anymore, there are quite a few others who take dollars, rupees and other things and give, and give us Bitcoins or Dogcoin, Litecoin, whatever I have you. So, one way of acquiring these cryptocurrencies is to buy them using other currencies and vice versa. If I have a Bitcoin, if I have a Dogcoin, I can go to one of these exchanges they will do the job of converting that into dollars, rupees, yen, pounds, what have you. These are some of the four, these are four major characteristics. Some of the others, the cost of transaction is very low. Since there are no intermediaries, for example, in India, for example, if you take Reserve Bank of India, the cost of running the currency for RBI to issue new notes, announce their exchange rates, various other things that they do. like uh, in, in, CRR, repo rate, various other things they do. They announce the buying and selling rates to set the value of the rupee. They print new rupees as and when the need rises. They mint new coins as and when the new need arises. When I take back an old soiled note, I can take it back to a bank and RBI will exchange it for me. All these things cost money. The budget of RBI at a minimum is the cost of running the rupee as a currency. So, there is a big cost involved it is quite significant. However, in the case of cryptocurrencies, this entire cost is practically 0. So, the cost of transaction is very low. The cost to maintain this currency is quite low. So, cost of transactions is low, the cost of productions is low. And the another key aspect is they are highly divisible. All currencies are only divisible up to a point, 1 rupee at the most will be equal to this is the rupee symbol 100 paise. In fact, who, who even uses a paise, 1 dollar is equal into 100 cents. A bitcoin on the other hand can be divided into that is for accounting, this is the lowest unit we recognize 1 paise. So, sometimes you can see on your 
electricity bill, credit card bill and all, your total due is 2136.35. 2136 rupees 35 paisa is your electricity bill or your credit card bill, tax bill, what have you. So, this is the lowest unit that is 1 by 0 0.01 of that currency is the lowest unit that our accounting systems recognize. On the other hand, the bitcoin, the, the concept applies to other things too, the blockchain of bitcoin can, can keep track of 100 millionth of a bitcoin. 1 over 100 million that is equal to 1 followed by 6, 7 zeros, 8 zeros. Unit 10, 100,000, 10,000, lakh, million, 1 more, 8 zeros. Sorry, let me write it again. Or is it. So, bit, the smallest unit that is recognized with the Bitcoin blockchain this. So, I can buy something if somebody is willing to accept this, I can buy something with this much of a Bitcoin or rather the, the way they write. So, they are so highly divisible. So, if you want we will see in the session on micropayments that this is ideal for micropayments. Even the smallest amount of the problem with micropayments is how do we keep track of such low values? How, what does it take to deal with them? What is it? What is the cost of transaction doing? Here we can go back up to 1, 0 followed by 8 zeros and 1 and that is the smallest unit that the Bitcoin algorithm, Bitcoin blockchain can keep track of. So, they are highly divisible. In that sense, they are very, very different from regular currencies. And the last point, which is both their strong point and weak point, and weak point, every process here is preset and controlled by an algorithm. It's pretty clear under what conditions a new Bitcoin will be issued. It's pretty clear under what conditions a transaction will be accepted. It's very clear how do we create that Bitcoin, not not in response to monetary conditions and economy, economy and things like that. It's all decided by algorithms. What are the terms and conditions to accept a transaction? What are the terms and conditions to write the transaction into the book blockchain? So, everything is controlled by an algorithm and not by a sovereign entity. So, it is not under anybody's control. So, everybody in a Bitcoin system, we the moment we follow those rules, we are all equal. So, I might have started my account, the Federal Reserve and RBI may also start their own accounts in Bitcoin, but they have no more rights to create new coins or invalidate old coins than I do. So, all of us will mine, if I mine, I get those Bitcoins. If bunch of miners call in, um, form a syndicate and mine, they will get bitcoins. If Federal Reserve uses all its heavy duty computers and mines, it will also get the same number of bitcoins. And they cannot invalidate a transaction any more than I can invalidate. That is, once a tra transaction is accepted and written into the bitcoin, they can no longer validate that, cancel that out. And third, <coughs> they are global in nature, whereas many of these sovereign entities try to have a tight control over the currency and those currencies are only accepted within national boundaries. There are exceptions of course, there is Ecuador which accepts dollar as the currency, there is no other currency in Ecuador which accepts the dollar and a bit of history till the late 70s, Indian rupee was the valid currency in the Middle East in UAE, what is called UAE today, Dubai and all, they were using Indian rupee. So, it is not necessary, but in general sovereign entities try to make, try to establish a tight control over how they manage the currency, here they do not, they have no more rights, it is all done by independently. So, I can use my Bitcoin anywhere in the world without bothering about exchange, foreign exchange controls, this, that and all and I can do it pseudonymously. If I am buying arms, if I am buying drugs for example, these sovereign entities and the, the uh, investigative agencies find it very difficult to traffic it down. So, there is a bit of suspicion that these are using, these, these currencies are being used by international criminals, terrorists and all for very nefarious activities. That is why many countries do not recognize these cryptocurrencies. For example, in India it is still unclear, it is not clear that whether I can, I can go to an exchange buy a Bitcoin. Till recently RBI had banned that. If I was found in possession of Bitcoin, I am doing an illegal act. So, that is what makes governments, sovereign entities uncomfortable because 
everything is controlled by an controlled by a preset program. We all know what that it is, but we can't do anything about it. If I want to deal with Bitcoin, I have to deal with the rules of the Bitcoin algorithm or the Bitcoin platform. That's one characteristic of cryptocurrencies. That's in that sense they are different from digital cash. Digital cash is, are actually issued in a digital form by these cryptocurrency by various sovereign entities or other parties too. For example, the JP Morgan coin issued by the JP Morgan Chase Bank, it's called JPM coin and its value is linked to a dollar. The value of one JP Morgan coin is always one dollar. It is just has other benefits. That is the reason we use some time back Facebook also had an idea that it will introduce its own currency called liberty. It did not happen, it does not happen yet. So, that is the difference between cryptocurrencies and these digital cash. They are actually controlled currencies, cryptocurrencies are not. So, these are some of the features of cryptocurrencies. And the key problem that cryptocurrency has solved is this problem of double spending. When I talked about double spending in the discussion about its money, double spending refers to I have a bitcoin in the form of a file in the form of data. When I give you bitcoin, I am transferring it to you, right. So, what happens? You have the copy of the file, I also have the copy of the file. I can use it to buy something else somewhere and nobody can tell me which where this file I have originated from. It is a copy of this, which is a copy of what I have given you. This is a called the problem of double spending. The same unit, I can use it for multiple purchases. That is a big problem which is difficult to solve. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies solved it. Bitcoin solved it first by recording the transaction in a uh, uh, open register. By writing it into the blockchain, at any point, if I have given, if I have bought something from you, giving you, I bought an expensive car, I bought a Tesla, giving one Bitcoin, the note on the file which gets encoded changes the name of the owner, changes the name of the owner from me to Tesla. So, anyone who, if I present the same file, I still have the file. If I present the same Bitcoin as a Bitcoin to somebody else, that person can go and see the trace the path of this. And when that person traces the path, the last entry against this particular Bitcoin will show Tesla, not me. So, that is how it, uh, they avoid the problem of double spending. They have made digital cash possible. This is one strong st strength of cryptocurrencies. They solved this problem of double spending. Okay? So, here is a comparison between gold, which we saw was historically one of the strong measures of money, units of money, currency, the fiat currency, US dollar and crypto, Bitcoin. Various features are compared. Are they interchangeable? Can gold be changed to a dollar? Can gold be changed to a Bitcoin? Can Bitcoin be changed to a dollar? Yes, all three are. Now, today there are exchanges who can do all these transactions for us, currency exchanges. Non-consumable, that means does it lose its value, does it get worn out for a period of time? No, gold does not change, it amount, amount remains the same, same with fiat currencies, same with Bitcoin over a period of time, their value does not decay. Portability, can we carry it around? Gold is moderate. Part of portability, remember, if we take it and carry and lose it, can we recover that? Chances are very low with gold, whereas with fiat currency and with cryptocurrency, portability is quite high. Fiat currencies, remember, we can carry them in a wallet, e-wallet also. Durable, gold is highly durable, it is a noble metal, period of time does not deteriorate, whereas fiat currency, the notes wear out over a period of time, coins may wear out over a period of time. Bitcoin, digits do not wear, they remain in the same form, so provided we take proper backups and do not lose to correction. Divisibility, gold is not even moderate, it is low. We can only divide gold probably at most into 1 gram, not more than that. Fiat currency, moderate. We know most currencies can be divided into one hundredth of those for accounting purposes. Here, cryptocurrency is very high. As we have seen, Bitcoin alone can be divided into one millionth, one hundred millionth part of the Bitcoin. Secure, can it be counterfeited? Not easy. Gold cannot be easily counterfeited. We cannot create gold again, right? We may make things look like gold, but can be found out. Here counterfeit is a problem. There are many inter illegal criminal syndicates which specialize in counterfeiting currencies. Here this can be counterfeited, but it has been accounted for by the using a blockchain. We are trying to make sure that it cannot be easily counterfeited. If however, somebody discovers a bug in the program, 
they can exploit that bug to create new currency which is not valid at all it should not be valid but the algorithm will not be able to distinguish so security the chances of that is high but so far as bitcoin is concerned so far it has turned out to be secure nobody has been able to hack into that can we use it for transactions not easy we have to carry gold can we break it and suppose i buy 5 kgs of tomatoes can i nip off a piece of gold and give it to him not very easy fiat currency yes transactions are very easy cryptocurrency equally easy supply one of the things about money what prevents somebody from arbitrarily printing any amount of money that's where the role of agencies comes in scarcity gold is precious because it's scarce it's not available everywhere so that's why we value that likewise national agencies like rbi control the value of money by making it scarce they don't print notes arbitrarily if they do there are countries where it's happening like zimbabwe where who are exp ex experiencing what is called hyperinflation so most sovereign agencies control against it so scarcity is it's a predictable but it can it's made scarce this is definitely scarce so many of the cryptocurrencies control the value control the release of the currency and it's predictable but low sovereign issued by government not necessarily anybody can in many countries people can mine for gold wherever it is available government control is high in the case of fiat currencies in case of cryptocurrencies practically zero the governments have no control over this currencies decentralized no gold is not necessarily decentralized fiat currencies are definitely not decentralized they are highly centralized whereas in cryptocurrency they are highly decentralized in fact that is one of their foundational natures can we program them can we make them serve different different purposes certainly not true with gold not true with fiat currency but very highly we can change the nature of the cryptocurrency by programming the algorithm like it has happened to bitcoin there are now two types of bitcoin today bitcoin classic and bitcoin cash such things are not easy in the case of fiat currencies so this is a comparison between the three types of currencies so that brings us to the next point so that's a brief introduction about cryptocurrencies however we have dealt with cryptocurrency here solely as a currency as a medium of exchange and not as a security unfortunately bulk of the news today is solely focused on the value of these cryptocurrencies the way we obsess or we follow the news about price of reliance share the price of tcs share so cryptocurrencies are solely treated as securities so some countries allow that some countries allow you to invest in cryptocurrencies and gain if the value of blockchain goes up it it actually fluctuates wildly if it goes from 50000 to 70000 dollars they let you treat it as a security but not as a medium of exchange medium of exchange means what for example if i buy a pizza from you i contract i need to give you 500 rupees for the pizza if you don't deliver the pizza and take my money in whichever form by an online payment or paytm or what have you if you don't deliver i can take you to court the court will recognize that i have given you a valid currency a valid medium of exchange you have not provided the service or the product in change in case of cryptocurrencies many governments don't allow that they don't allow they don't let me if i give a bitcoin to somebody and for whatever reason that person takes it and runs away doesn't give me the 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 service or the product many many jurisdictions don't recognize that as a valid transaction so that's one of the downsides of cryptocurrency the governments don't recognize that but however some governments let us do this that i can invest in a cryptocurrency gain or loss as the case happens gain from the gain in value convert it back into my original currency dollar rupee or what have you and pay taxes and treat it like any other security that's one way of recognition some other governments have a limited amount of digital currency like i believe some countries let you pay the government taxes in the form of they accept cryptocurrency only for government taxes not for any legal transactions so <clears throat> these are some of the problems of cryptocurrency so and secondly as i said it's not treated as a currency it is treated as a security for a period of time it might become a true security that we can use these as a medium of exchange to buy things to store value and get away from this obsession with treating us as a security 
Today it is not used much as a medium of exchange, mainly as a security to speculate on its value. So, that for that is a brief introduction into cryptocurrencies. While we are at it, let me show you a few examples of cryptocurrencies which are very popular in the market. In the previous lecture, I showed you this slide. These are some of the more popular cryptocurrencies. This is Bitcoin. This was actually formulated by a bunch of scientists and uh, finance experts called Cardano to fulfill certain purposes. The second most common cryptocurrency, second also which was second to enter the market also is called Ethereum that is the blockchain is called Ethereum. This crypto the currency itself is called Ether. It has the second highest value next to Bitcoin among all the traded cryptocurrencies. This is a cryptocurrency called Monero. This is called Litecoin. Litecoin's value depends on the value of Bitcoin. Its value is indexed to the value of Bitcoin. There is one called Tether. There is an additional Bitcoin in the in the previous session I mentioned that blockchain got broken into two separate chains. This separate chain is called Bitcoin Cash. BCH it's called BCH. So likewise, there are lot of there is I have not even given things like Dogcoin and all. It started off as a joke, but now it has become a legitimate cryptocurrency. There are a lot of cryptocurrencies, new and new ones are coming to the market every day and mostly they are all built on the blockchain. Most of them have most of the common, common features I talked about. Most of them follow the same, all of them are driven by an algorithm, the rate of, pro rate of production is predictable, uh, they, some many of them also max out at certain value. So, beyond certain number of currency coins issued, they become deflationary in nature and some of them are aimed at very specific purposes. So, new and new things are happening, it is one of the more very happening uh, fields of fintech. So, let us get back to the previous slide. So, the next aspect I would like to cover is money transfer networks. We looked at cryptocurrency, the next part of fintech I would like to look at is our money transfer networks. So, historically, International transfer of money is one of the key functions of finance. In this concept, in this area, historically before these banks and all got established, there was one method of currency exchange, it is called Hawala. Hawala, I will explain that in a little more in when we talk about the next, uh, next money exchange product. But there was one, there was always a method by means of which money exchanges, exchanges in two different countries who do this business of converting from rupee to the lira in the Roman empire or whatever the currency was in other empires and whatever the currency was in India. It has been rupee for a very long time, but there were always these private for informal networks which took care of this conversion business. And over a period of time, well recognized banks and other financial institutions entered into the picture. Today, it is a very organized structure. At any point, I can go to one of these money exchanges. I can buy any currency, I can pay rupees so far as the government lets me. Some governments do not make the currency convertible or buyable. Indian government has made the rupee partly convertible. So, I can buy dollars. If my child goes to US for studies, I want to I can pay for them in dollars by giving the banks here my rupees. The banks pay dollars to the bank in the US which will pay the university. So, rupee is convertible within limits. So, we have a formal method by means of which money is historically money is transferred and exchanged as appropriate. There are a lot of players in the in the middle and obviously, it is a as of now it is an expensive and time consuming process. And one key player in the international money exchange business till now traditionally is this organization called SWIFT. Historically SWIFT it stands for Society for Worldwide Interbank financial telecommunications has been the key intermediary or most of the messages to convert these currencies, buy that currency, deposit in somebody's account, what rate to buy, what rate to sell, how much to, all these messages have been managed on the background by this organization called SWIFT. I think it is based in Belgium <coughs> and it was a dominant player, it is almost a monopoly. But SWIFT's role today is being challenged by new and new players. One such player is called Ripple. So, we will look at a take a look at these two organizations SWIFT and Ripple and how, how they work with international monetary exchange. 
this again is one of the key elements our financial system today heavily depends on this to transfer vast amounts of money across continents across geographies across domains things like that so let's look at swift first swift is a limited liability cooperative society it's not a commercial organization it's a cooperative society with head office in belgium its initial objective was to create a central point for passing off secure and standardized messages coming from banks that are mainly interested in payment messages secure and standardized different countries use different terms for the same transaction for the same action and it was very difficult in computers we need to have consistency right if i if i use the word currency people can understand easily that i am also talking about money depending on the context computers cannot understand that if i have to say currency separately i have to say money separately they don't make sense that depending on the context if i say currency i'm referring to currency as a concept if i say currency i'm referring to currency as a unit of or the the implementation of money so this company came to standardize such terms standardize that those terms and messages and give a secure channel to transmit those messages across messages with between banks across the world for the purpose of money change and that's even today it's one of its biggest activities and today it is defined over 200 types of messages pay sell buy deposit credit debit each one has a different different message short short cryptic message which are easy to trans transmit over the wire whether it be through satellites or through cables what have you and those messages cover there are various types of messages covering different activities like credit and debit instru instructions debit so much money into the account of university of pennsylvania in philadelphia that's one message i mean debit has a separate message to add these components into that and do that activity credit buy and sell orders for currencies not for other items documentary credits whenever credit is given document that collections guarantees interbank transfers so swift essentially works as a messenger it doesn't work like a bank it works as a messenger it has defined a set of messengers messages all the banks use these set of messages to transmit monetary information between them in a very safe very secure very reliable manner once i use swift when i send a message swift may guarantee that message will reach the customer in a limited amount of time ideally we want it instantaneously even otherwise it may give some limit saying that within 20 seconds it will reach and things like that so it's a cooperative society used for money interchange sir as the latest count there are more than 10000 users these are banks central banks other kinds of financial institutions investment banks and things like that these members remember it's a cooperative society they're not customers the members have a number of shares in the capital of the company which shall be proportional to the usage of the message transmission services of the company there are 2400 live members so if rbi does 1 million messages in a month and the federal reserve does 10 million messages in a month the number of shares that rbi federal reserve will have will be 10 times the number of shares that rbi owns in this society that is members who do more transactions have a greater say in the uh, activities and the policies of this organization than members who use less but everybody has some say they are all members all the members have a say in how this organization works and delivers its services there is another category called sub members their organizations at least 50% directly or 100% indirectly owned by a member with full management control like rbi has many subsidiaries like npca being one of them for example promoted by rpi it can become a sub member rbi has other organizations too likewise federal reserve has other organizations which is which may be 50% directly or 100% indirectly owned by the member and controlled by that organization they also can become members rbi can become members all its promoted organizations also can become members but they become what are called as sub members and there are such more than 3000 sub members and the rest of them are called participants other than members and sub members any organization may be permitted to make use of specific services the company of the company at participant not entitled to shares in the capital of the company there are 4565 such participants 
these are organizations make, make services like customers and pay them fees for that purpose. Swift historically has been a very profitable monopoly, but that is being challenged. So, till recently almost all international transactions went through Swift. Now, for example, if I use a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, if I make a payment to somebody in Australia or something I buy, now it is done independently, completely independently out of the range of Swift. Does not even come to Swift? it happens directly on the Bitcoin ecosystem. One more reason why sovereign entities do not want to accept cryptocurrency, a reluctant rather one do not want to. The broader SWIFT community also encompasses corporates as well as market infrastructure in payment, securities, treasury and trade. Various other organizations which deal with all these also make use of services of SWIFT and SWIFT may also deal with them to transmit their messages. SWIFT is neither a financial institution nor a payment system, it is solely a carrier of messages. It is just a messenger that is what they say, but it is so powerful because it carries almost all the messages. Every system goes through SWIFT, that is one reason why we should understand the role of SWIFT. It is a company which we never hear of because it works in the background, but it is a very critical element of international money exchange mechanism. It does not hold asset or manage accounts, information in messages transmitted through SWIFT is controlled exclusively by the sending and receiving financial institutions. What message is being sent, SWIFT has no control. SWIFT says these are the 200 messages you can send, pick any and send, no problem. Pick any and send any number of times, no problem, but you decide which message to send, SWIFT simply carries them in a secure manner. <coughs> and thus the rates of exchange, this, that and all are actually decided by the banks themselves or the organizations and the institutions themselves. A rival to that has come up from the field of fintech. Many are coming up, one has become quite popular from the list of members you will see why it is so and who are the members that and it is a network called Ripple. Ripple also is a message carrier. Cut, even. So, one of the challengers to the monopoly of SWIFT is this fintech company called Ripple. This is a presentation taken from the company's own uh, documents. What is Ripple? Ripple is a real time gross settlement system, RTGS remember bulk payment systems we talked about, RTGS bulk payments, payment system, currency exchange and remittance network very much like SWIFT. Ripple focuses on providing cross border payment solutions. Beyond messaging it is also entering into the area of payment solutions, but it started off as a messaging system. Its main goal is to eliminate the need for older systems like Western Union or SWIFT. This is where it is a rival to SWIFT and it implements a modern version of Havala, I will come back to that. Before we go any further, let me play this small video issued by this company which explains in concept what Ripple is. Here is a video explaining Ripple, the company, the concept and what it does been produced by the company itself. It is a short video, let us take a look at that, how the ripple net works. It is a network between various financial participants in the world and global in nature. So, these are some of the key features that are required and offered by Ripple. The interconnection between various systems is one of the big challenges. There may be a single carrier of messages, but the actual exchange goes through many hops and many players. Disparate means separate, independent, slow, error prone and expensive, something we have been highlighting throughout this series.
at the end we will see a list of banks which have signed up with Ripple to use their services. There are a few Indian banks too. So that was a video explaining the products of this company and Intrad introducing this company called Ripple. So let us see that at leisure in the form of text. So to come back, Ripple is a RTGS system, essentially a message transmission payment. It is a it started off as a message transmission system, it is grown evolved into many various things. It focuses on international exchange, not necessarily within a country main goal is to compete and eliminate the older systems like Western Union or SWIFT. As I said, it implements a modern version of Havala. The way Havala works, though it has a bad connotation today, it is a legitimate system in the pre-modern days where there are two agents, let us say one in India and one in Saudi Arabia. Somebody who wants to pay money to transfer money to Saudi Arabia comes to me and gives 1 lakh rupees. We exchange some form of identification like a code word. I will tell my a person, my contact in Saudi Arabia saying that pay X amount of money to person B when he gives you that code word, code word. This person A conveys that code word to person B in some form when he goes to the agent and gives that code word, the agent in Saudi Arabia deducts the commission, pays the rest of the money. Likewise, there will be transfers from Saudi Arabia to India also. At the end of a period, say week, one month, I will add up all the money I have received and I, he adds up all the money he has received that money has to come to India, this money has to go to Saudi Arabia. So, if in a period he has received 3 lakhs, I have received 5 lakhs, that means I need to send 2 lakhs to that person short of commissions, that is how we settle the accounts. So, this has been done historically and Ripple started off implementing a version of that. 
messages are being sent, transactions are netted once in periods. Now, of course, it is grown up into many more things, other products that you talked about. How is it from different from Bitcoin? It is not a blockchain, it actually uses an open ledger, but it is not a shared ledger, but not a blockchain. It is consensus oriented, but controlled by this company. Ripple's token is not mined like Bitcoin, Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. Where it is beats them is Bitcoin can handle 3 to 6 transactions per second. Ripple is, is able to handle, this network is able to handle 1500 transactions per second. The Ripple net, the network which does actually the uh, transmission is a network of payment providers such as banks, money services, businesses that use solutions developed by Ripple to provide a smooth experience. It uses payment gateways. A gateway is essentially a digital portal that governments, companies and financial institutions use to join the network. This mechanism is called Ripple net which is also covered in the video. It has three products which is also covered in the video, X current, real time messaging equivalent of Swift, X via accounting system to track payments, X rapid is a way to actually transfer money. It uses XRP, it has been tested by Western Union, it is its own cryptocurrency we will see. Okay. These are the three products that Ripple offers. Benefits, transactions are cheaper and quicker than a Bitcoin. However, it is a legitimate system, many banks use it actually and it has the abil ability to be exchanged to any currency. We can convert rupees to XRP, XRP can be converted into dollars at the either end if all the parties agree to it. These are some of the banks which are using Ripple, they are supporting Ripple. Among India, we see Axis Bank and S Bank, this is an Australian bank, this is a Spanish bank, like that. This is a Swiss bank, Union Bank of Switzerland. So, a lot of banks, it is a legitimate system, a lot of banks are using Ripple to do their international transactions. And on top of it, it has its own cryptocurrency record XRP, it is not as traded as Bitcoin and others, but as they have said themselves, it can be used for interchanging and transferring money across the world, it is their own crypto token. The thing is, its transactions are faster than Bitcoin, but it is independent of the network. You do not have to use the XRP to use the Ripple's network. So, that brings us to the topics that I wanted to cover. The next topic is micropayment that we will cover in the next lecture. So, this brings us to the topics I wanted to cover. I have, we have covered cryptocurrency and international financial exchange mechanisms. This program was broadcast on channel 16 on the Swayamprabha program. Thank you.